All right, welcome everyone. It's so great to see so many faces on this call today. Um, this is the People's Town Hall event. I'm Ashley Sunholm with the Prince William Conservation Alliance. And tonight we're hosting this space to highlight um, some of the concerning aspects of the Independent Hill Small Area Plan. As a quick overview of how tonight will go, um, we'll begin with comments from our panelists. Each of our seven panelists will have five minutes to share with us their perspectives and insights. And then after each panelist has had a chance to speak, we'll move, um, we'll open it up for Q&A and comments and conversation like um, we just got a little preview of. Um, here and uh, and you can feel free to use the chat and of course raise your hand. There's a raise your hand option and we'll um, we'll do our best to circle around and give everyone everyone time to speak that would like to. Um, so with that, thank you for being here with us and I will pass it on to Kim. Hi everybody, thanks for coming. It's very nice to see you all. And if you give me a minute here, I'm just going to share my screen quickly as we listen to the dog. And all I'm putting up here is a map of the area that we're talking about. So on the left, we're looking at the outline of the small area plan boundaries. Um, which is on both sides of Route 234 in the vicinity of the landfill, which I hope you can see my cursor, which is right mm -hmm. over here. And the area around there is mostly undeveloped with some significant environmental and cultural resources. What's proposed is a dense community in a semi-rural area with overcrowded schools and no hopes for public transportation in the foreseeable future. Staff is looking for up to 200 homes on quarter acre or less lots, and I believe up to 2.25 million square feet of non-residential space. So on the right and down at the bottom where you see the green parks and open space and the stripes for the PFO, I have that, that area clipped out so you can see a little bit more about the environmental assets on that particular property which is, um, as you can see, surrounded on, by Prince William Forest National Park, and it's bisected by Quantico Creek. The image at the, on the top is from the National Wetlands Inventory, and from the bottom, it's from the county mapper showing the stream with the RPA. So a question has been for a while is why is, it's about 160 acres, why is that property included in this SAP since it is in the rural crescent and it is in the legislative boundaries of Prince William Forest Park. Um, I know that I went to the charrettes and there were six groups. I know my group, which was actually mostly developers, thought this area should remain as parkland and um, in the rural crescent. And I believe that out of the six breakout groups, four of them made that recommendation. Nevertheless, we see it here replanned for um, um, really what is, we've heard is planned as an industrial use as a data center. So that is kind of inexplicable in this area, especially for a, a property that is in the legislative boundaries of Prince William Forest Park. And I just want to take a minute to say, that the legislative boundary represents a park's border as it was defined by Congress. So there is a management boundary, which is the property that is actually owned by the National Park Service. And then the legislative boundary, which covers properties that were approved to be a part of Prince William Forest Park, but were not purchased at that time. And, hope, and the hope would be is that this particular property could be purchased and added to the park. So I hope everybody's good with these images and we can put them up if you choose. So I'd like to talk just a couple minutes about why it matters and why Prince William Forest Park is so important. 
Prince William Forest Park protects the largest Piedmont forest in the National Park Service, and it is the largest green space in the Washington DC metropolitan region. It is an Audubon important birding area, and it's known locally as one of the best birding habitats in Northern Virginia. It protects several native plants and animals, <coughs> and it captures a transition from the coastal plain to Piedmont ecosystems. Its value to current and future research is significant, and that will only continue to grow over time. Every year, nearly 400,000 people visit Prince William Forest National Park. In 2018, those park visitors spent an estimated $17.9 million in local gateway communities. Those expenditures supported 219 jobs and 23.8 million in economic output in the local area, that's Prince William County. It's a huge asset for our tourism, business, um, tourism goals. And as we can see from the pandemic, people value their green open space. We want more places to go. And in addition, to the environmental assets and environmental benefits. It, it just is something that is highly desired by people and looked for as part of a healthy community. That property, the 160 acres also lies within the Rural Crescent, which is a smart growth tool we're all familiar with th that helps the county minimize the negative financial impacts of sprawl development. In addition, the Rural Crescent maintains a low density, so we have a low amount of impervious surfaces, which is really important for our public drinking water supply. The entire Rural Crescent drains into the Occoquan Reservoir and adding significant impervious surfaces will certainly be reflected at the end of um, the water's journey from the Rural Crescent down to the reservoir. So that is something that we want to consider when deciding what to do in the Rural Crescent. The property also covers the headwaters of Quantico Creek, which has been classified by several studies as one of the highest quality and most biologically diverse streams in the Northern Virginia area. It's used as a reference stream in other areas. And um, like Again, that. adding significant impervious surfaces, especially from a data center, would cause significant impacts that would damage the creeks and the effects would be felt all the way downstream when it flows into the Potomac River. Prince William County, in our view, should be working with the National Park Service to purchase this land and add it to Prince William Forest Park. The benefits are huge and um, it would certainly be worth the investment. We are really fortunate to have uh, some, some wonderful people here and knowledgeable people here to talk about different aspects of this proposed small area plan. And first I'm going to introduce Nancy Beers, who is with the Virginia Native Plant Society. And thank you for coming and turn the program over to you, Nancy. Well, thank you, Kim. Yes, I'm Nancy Beers. I'm the president of the statewide Virginia Native Plant Society, as well as the local chapter, which is the Prince William Wildflower Society. Um, we're a statewide conservation group. We have nearly 2,000 members statewide, and our local chapter has about 200 members. Our catchphrase is conserving wildflowers and wild places. And this 160-acre site is definitely one of those wild places that we would like to conserve. Um, I'm going to read some of the text that I presented to the Planning Commission. And thankfully the Planning Commission did vote to deny this um, special um, small area plan, but it was a five to three vote. So it was not a resounding vote, but it was it's still a majority. And so um, I would hope that the Board of, Super Board of County Supervisors would listen to the recommendations of their appointed commissioners, but we'll see. So, you know, we in the native plant community are very concerned about this proposal to replan and include that 160 acre undeveloped, mostly forested property into a designation that would allow the data center. And, you know, as Kim has said, it's bounded on several sides by 
Prince William Forest Park, a national park that is a gem in our community, you know. Um, and because this property is now sort of on the market or is, you know, attention has been played to it, maybe we could use this opportunity to try and buy that property and, you know, flatten the edges of the park. And I know the park is very willing to, to try and, and work on that. Um, one of the things that hasn't been talked about is the rare plants. Um, unfortunately, none of us has had an opportunity to survey this 160 acres, but it could provide the habitat for at least one rare species, um, the globally imperiled and federally threatened small world pagonia. It's found in the park and in another um, area near the park. Um, and this kind of habitat is perfect for this, this rare orchid. And we'd like to save some of these special things. We don't want to pave over all of our special things. Um, this small world pagonia, Isotria metalloides, is, has a small population in the park and it's in the, con in the conservation area across from Humphreys Road. It's a small, rare orchid. It's really cool when you do see it. Um, but it, it deserves protection. I'm also worried about forest fragmentation. Dividing up that 160 acres creates more edge habitat, and that's the habitat that's preferred by white-tailed deer. So I just think you know we're providing more habitat for those deer to browse in the in the forest. Um, it's a deer are a serious concern to our forests. Um, over browsing our young trees so we don't have forest re regeneration. And then also all these deer that are running across the road and causing traffic accidents. So, you know, the more we fragment our forest, you know, chop it up into little parts, the more fragmentation, you know, the more um, deer edge habitat we have. Um, invasive plants are the other thing when you fragment the forest. And that is a major concern here. Prince William Forest Park really, um, is, is a gem in the way that it doesn't have a major problem with invasive plants. Invasive plants are non-native plants that um, are ecologically damaging. And it's, it's a nice park. It's, it's not pristine by any means, but if you go in some of our other areas, it's nothing but, you know, Japanese honeysuckle and English ivy and, you know, just so much winter creeper, you know, things that are not native. Japanese barberry, whatever. Um, but Prince William Forest Park doesn't have that. But if you start topping it up, you bring in heavy equipment, you know, um, their tires are gonna spread the seeds, you know, people coming in, it's just gonna ruin the habitat that's there, the, the forest that we already have. So disturbed soil is absolutely right for invasive plants to take hold, you know, you scratch up the soil, these seeds are just going to come right in and take over. So um, it costs the park a lot of money. It costs any national park a lot of money to you know, um, combat inv invasive plants. So the more that we can keep them out, we can save. Um, also, you know, this is a really important Piedmont uh, forest that deserves protection. There aren't that many Piedmont forests that are, um, that are parks like this. As noted on um, Prince William Forest Park's website, they, it preserves 15,000 acres of Piedmont Forest covering a significant portion of the Quantico Creek watershed. It represents one of the largest parcels of undeveloped land in the area and is the third largest unit of the national park system in Virginia. Um, that combined with the fact that it's the largest example of a Piedmont Forest in the national park system makes it a significant natural resources here, here in Prince William. And it contains two, what we call physiographic provinces. It has both the Piedmont and the coastal plain. So it includes a transition zone between the two. So um, many species are at the outer limits of their ranges and that allows for diversity habitat, vegetative communities, um, species comp uh, composition that's generally found in um, any single forest type. So it's approximately two thirds in the Piedmont and one third in the coastal plain. And finally, the importance of nature. We just can't overstate how important nature is to us. As this COVID-19 pandemic runs on, you know, our parks are overrun with people trying to get away, 
you know, wanting some open space and air. It's not, a, it's a time to expand our parks. You know, we need more open space. We need to keep what we have and we need to conserve this 160 acre parcel. So um, I just, I, I feel very passionately about this and I know I'm speaking to the choir here, I suppose, but this is a parcel worth saving and not a place for industrial use data center. Thanks Thank so you. much, Nancy, and I couldn't agree with you more. I feel very passionate about this also. And before we move on to our next speaker, I would just like to welcome Supervisor Janine Lawson. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, everybody with Conservation Alliance. Ashley, I look forward to meeting you. And Nancy, that was wonderful. I'm actually very anxious to go see the Bluebells. I'm sure everybody is. Um, I need to get to the uh, to the forest park. I have not done that in full honesty, but I, I certainly need to. Oh, and yes, I, you do. <laughs> I know. And maybe you'll give me a tour and teach me about all the, the natives. Sounds uh, good, Nancy. We got a fun job ahead of us. <laughs> sure. And uh, I, I just couldn't help but l listen to all of you before this forum started and I just can't tell you how appreciative I am of everybody's knowledge. You're, it's really remarkable. We live in a community where people are not going to be easily duped and you know informed, informed citizenry equals an effective government and um, I just really am impressed with everybody's knowledge. Elena, I think Dominion Energy still has nightmares about you. Um, <laughs> listen, that that power line would have never been undergrounded along 66 if it were not for Elena Slosberg and a few other key leaders in the community. So um, Bob Weir, I think he's on this, on this Zoom meeting as well, and Karen Sheehan. Uh, but anyway, I'm just really looking forward to learning more and I've already learned a lot uh, about uh, Prince William Forest and look forward to learning more tonight. Thank you very much, everybody. And I will say this, there's one last thing I just wanna put a red flag on. Uh, I had a meeting this afternoon with uh, the, app, the applicant, or actually he's not an applicant yet for the data center uh, on the small area plan. And, uh, uh, I certainly think hope. Janine, we're losing you. On Tuesday night, make a move to extend that PFO portion, like 40 acres along the frontage of 234. Which in that she's, oh, I was in that PFO along the 234 frontage on the small area plan. So you're saying he wants to extend it? Yeah, and and, larger. Yes, and and I'm concerned that Supervisor Bailey is going to make that move from the day. So oh, God. Tuesday during the result, uh, the during project the will get worse. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Janine. Thanks. This is Joe Fontanella. Just to uh, uh, yes. corroborate what you're say, saying, you know, we've heard the same thing too. That uh, the Potomac District is not happy with limiting this to 40 acres. And the owner of that property is very interested in putting a data center there and really isn't interested in a whole lot else. Except extending the 40 acres to 80. Well, yes, or more. Okay, that's good to know because I guess that would happen at the vote, which is scheduled for next Tuesday night. Thank you very much for sharing that. It's good to know so we can be prepared. Um, and next, I'm gonna introduce Alan Ralston, who is the executive director of the Northern Virginia Conservation Trust, which is a land trust, which does hold conservation easements on some properties in Prince William. Thanks for being here, Alan, and welcome. And you should, yeah. Thank you, Kim, appreciate it. And um, appreciate everything Supervisor Lawson just said. Um, you know, I'm here because my organization, you know, since uh, the mid-90s has worked throughout Northern Virginia to really try to be 
you know, an answer and an opportunity for dilemmas and situations such as these. You know, we work um, in concert with local government, with conservation groups, with really anyone who has an interest in protecting land to bring balance to our communities, um, you know, to, protect, to try to protect what we can of, of, of open space and, and parks and uh, natural areas where possible. And we do hold um, 12 different conservation easements throughout Prince William County, um, totaling about 950 acres. Um, we are in, you know, pretty much constant conversation with, with landowners throughout the county at any given time. Um, and, you know, I'm here, you know, today in part because I, I do think this is a pretty unique property worth protecting. Um, it's pretty obvious from the maps that the, you know, connection to Prince William Forest Park is real. Um, you know, the stresses that a park like that has on it because of climate change, because of development are real. Um, and the more that you enhance, you know, and, and create more of those stressors, the more difficult it is for that park to be what everybody has always known it to be. Um, management of a place like that gets harder over time. Um, opportunities like these don't come along every day when you have a potential to add to that park and potentially head off a lot of problems down the road that you really can't even, you know, often, you know, plan for. And so, you know, I'm here in part to say that there are organizations out there like mine that really want to help, you know, broker a deal and be a part of a solution where, you know, we understand that, that uh, you know, a landowner, you know, is looking for certain, um, you know, certain outcomes out of a property. Um, and there are probably ways in which, you know, they can be you know, they can be partners with an organization like ours to achieve some of those goals theoretically while also achieving the goals that everyone here wants so badly to achieve. Um, for instance, you know, for probably the large majority of the nearly 150 different small nature preserves that we either own or steward or protect across Northern Virginia, most of those were protected using conservation easements. Um, and, and what most people don't realize is that Virginia has one of the most um, beneficial and profitable conservation easement tax credit programs in the United States, um, which means that if you are a developer, if you are any landowner throughout the state that owns property that has developable rights, you have the ability to relinquish some or all of those rights and derive a lot of value out of the property for yourself. Um, while assuring that that property is never developed again and theoretically could then be in the process of either being a part of the park or in a transitional phase where at the very least its, it's protection is assured and we're working towards an outcome where it could be purchased. Um, and so an organization like mine really works in a three-tiered strategy of, you know, we're either looking for donations of land, which also bring significant tax benefits, um, working together on a conservation easement to relinquish development rights or to buy a property outright if that is what a landowner desires and a combination of funds can be pulled together in order to achieve that purchase. Um, and, and as the years go by and more and more landowners realize that through organizations like ours and through partnership with so many of you on a call like this, we do have the opportunity to, to raise likely millions of dollars to purchase a property like this. And what you need is time and what you need is some cooperation, um, but you also need you know, agreement from um, the county, agreement from local political leadership and, and you know, many of the different levers you need to pull that that is what the future you know, for a property like this um, you know, should be so that we can give ourselves the time to go create that. Um, you know, in a, you know, we're working in Fairfax County, for instance, right now to buy a property that's probably going to end up costing us somewhere in the 17 to 18 million dollar range. Um, these are, um, these are opportunities that through state grants for land acquisition, federal grants for land acquisition, through private donations, through other sources, um, there is reason to believe that you can pull together a significant amount of money to not just be asking a landowner to donate a property or to put a conservation easement on it if that's what they want, but that you can actually be at the table, you know, making them a reasonable offer that, you know, would, would you know, be 
significant money in their pocket towards the outcome we all want here. Um, so I, I, I'm going to leave it at that, but just say that I think there's a lot of creative ways to work towards a protection of a site like this. Um, if you have, you know, real community support and an ability to pull together, you know, all, all, all the players, and, and many of them are here, but I, I know that many of them are not, and that there is challenges involved in making sure that those players understand what's at stake here. Um, but you probably only have one or two, you know, um, bites at this apple before, you know, you've lost the opportunity. And this group is here at the right time to try to make sure that we haven't lost that opportunity. But re time is not on our side. And I think we really have to move quickly um, to be able to take an opportunity here to either present to this landowner a, a better option or be working with the county towards a solution where with a little bit more time, we can be working towards something that works for everybody. Um, so I would look forward as we move forward to, you know, answering more specific questions about how, you know, something like this might work. Um, but it re there really are viable strategies here, you know, in order to acquire or otherwise assure um, limited or no development on a site like this. And I think we can be working towards those if we, you know, are focused in a way that, that brings everybody together the way I hear this evening. So appreciate being here. And as we move forward, happy to answer questions anybody might have. Thanks, Alan. And I just would like to make one comment that there is a team of people who have pulled together with interest in um, helping this property through a purchase be added to Prince William Forest Park. That includes my organization, Prince William Conservation Alliance, Alan's, as well as um, state and federal partners. But as Alan said, you need to have support from the locality and from the landowner. So um, we, we are still hoping against hope that that can be achieved. Next, we want to welcome Julie Bolthouse, who does covers land use for the Piedmont Environmental Council. And um, welcome, Julie. I don't see where you are, but speak up. Hello. Hi, there I'm you are. Good evening, everyone. I'm Julie Bolthouse. I'm the Falk here County Representative for Piedmont Environmental Council. And uh, before I, I get started with my, my comments that I've prepared, I, I just wanted to point out that the other aspect of land conservation that Alan uh, Ransom was just mentioning is strong land use policies. If the landowner has the expectation of selling their land as a data center or higher density residential, whatever, whatever the, um, the issue is, then conservation becomes impossible because the price will, will go that much higher for the property. So you have to keep that in mind. There's two sides. Um, I'm sorry? I think that was a mistake. Go ahead, Julie. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so uh, Piedmont Environmental Council is the organization um, I'm representing. Uh, our mission is to promote and protect uh, natural resources, the rural economy, history, and beauty of the Virginia Piedmont. We consider the protection of the rural crescent and Prince William to be the front lines of the battle against sprawl. So the rural crescent is home to farmers, rural residents. It is the breadbasket and recreational escape of many Prince William County residents, as Nancy mentioned. And it is also a place where history can be seen and experienced still. Rural land is often, though, just described as undeveloped by planners and developers. We believe these areas are worthy of thoughtful planning and protection, though. Every year, developers find new parcels in the rural area to target. The reason rural land is often targeted, um, while land zoned for higher intensity development in the core remains vacant, is because this is the cheapest land to convert um, to more intensive uses and wields more profit than buying land that's already planned for that use. In fact, there is a land proactively planned for data centers in Prince William County called the data center overlay. A, a quick look at the overlay on, their, on uh, Prince William County's GIS system shows that there are several undeveloped parcels that are over 100 acres available. There's also over a dozen larger than uh, 50 acres. And Kim Hosen's, uh, or the Prince William Conservation Alliance's um, alert that went out even pointed out that there, there is land just across the street um, in the old cells of the, the landfill. 
uh, brownfield development, which is an excellent place to put a data center or solar um, utility scale solar, something like that. Seen in isolation, this plan may seem fine. However, in context, it's really not. The Independent Hill Small Area Plan encompasses a semi-rural community containing a historic high sensitivity area, and it's in close proximity to, a to the national park. Uh, placing hundreds of homes far flung from transit and jobs is far from sustainable. And placing a massive data center at the ed edge of the rural crescent and next to the Prince William County Forest Park shows a lack of appreciation for either of these resources. Thoughtful planning would involve collaborating with the National Park Service, as, as Alan was just um, speaking to, and planning for uh, the preservation of a boundary around the park or purchasing opportunities to expand the park. It includes, it could even include things like streetscaping to improve the gateway to the park and the experience of going to the park. As a related side note, the use of small area plans here doesn't really make much sense, just from my, my personal opinion. The, the Virginia Code, and actually also from the definition of the Virginia Code, which I'm about to read to you, it defines the small area plans as plans that guide land use, zoning, transportation, urban design, open space, and capital improvements at a high level of detail within an urban development area or for a transit-oriented development that is at least a half square mile in size. That sounds like Independent Hill, right? <laughs> no, probably not. It's not, doesn't really seem like a, a urban area um, to me or um, really where you'd want to put a transit-oriented development. Prince William County may be creating more small area plans so that they can continue to receive proffers from speculative developers proposing projects at the urban fringes. So the 2016 proffer reform legislation hindered localities' ability to accept proffers for schools, public safety, and transportation capital improvements from residential rezonings. However, there is an exemption to that ruling, um, which allows um, for localities who have small area plans to uh, get basically operate in pre-2016 conditions um, for those rezonings. To meet the criteria for the exemption, localities have to have an approved small area plan in a revitalization area encompassing mass transit and including mixed use development and allowing a density of at least 3.0 floor area ratio in a portion of the site. Interestingly, um, and, and let me just clarify, mass transit in, is defined in the Virginia Code as including bus, um, commuter buses. Interestingly, the Independent Hill Small Area Plan incorporates mixed use, is planned to support a fixed route bus transit and will allow up to three story buildings, which would be a floor area of, uh, in, that, in that single area, it would reach that 3.0 floor area ratio. In a twisted irony, they may be planning for too much density here so that they can receive proffers needed to mitigate the impacts of growth at the fringe. In other words, they appear to be planning for more so that maybe they can mitigate the impact of some, which is really just not very good planning. So that's, that's my thoughts on, on the topic of planning. I got it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Julie. I'm sure there's gonna be questions later. And now um, I'm gonna welcome Martin Jeter with Mid-County Civic Association, who is gonna give us a little overview of the history of this area, which is pretty significant. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Tim. Uh, as Tim said, I'm Martin Jeter from the McKinney Civic Association. I'm going to do a little bit about history, but I, I wanted to um, follow up with Julie real quick. There, that was a that was a great presentation Julie gave, and she actually s stole a little bit of my thunder because I wanted to widen our discussion out a little bit before I go into the history and talk about the entire small area plan, which which Julie did a great job of. I mean, basically, this small area plan just doesn't fit into this area. It's too dense for the surrounding community. Um, the, the, um, there's no transit available here. The small air plan just doesn't make, doesn't make sense, but, but Julie um, laid that out much better than I, than I could. Um, 
the button, you know, there's, there's a number of different things wrong with this plan as far as besides the fact that they want to build data centers in the rural area. Um, and just real quickly, the, um, the buffers are, are very small and you have large lot community all around this plan and the buffers are only 20 or 30 feet in, in most areas. So, you know, there's just not going to be any kind of a, a delineation between this intense development in the area around it. So I won't say much more about that because Julie, like I said, Julie really did a great job with that. So a little bit about the history of, of this area. And, and I, I found a lot of this out by writing a few articles and, and you know, I, by no means am I a historian, but just a lot of this came up specific to this Independent Hill area when I was writing a, an article about um, Brentsville Road. And um, the one important thing about this land that we're talking about here tonight where the, where the data centers are um, planned for or the public facility slash office, you know, whichever way you want to say it, um, that 162 acres was, it, it could have been the property of the Epa Barnes family. And Epa Barnes was a slave in Prince William County who came back after emancipation and he came back to Prince William County and bought some of the land where he was actually enslaved, which um, was along 234, and the, the records have not been um, checked to see exactly where his land was. So in the process of this small area plan, um, we were hoping that we could do a kind of a deep dive into this whole historical aspect like they did uh, for the Route 29 small area plan for the settlement, which was out there. Some of you may know what I'm talking about, which is basically a similar thing where there was a, a, a large African-American community that had been there for generations and, and, and they did the research on that and came up with a lot. A lot of it has to be oral research at this point because there's not a lot of physical things left from, from the communities that were there, but the, the oral research was done and, and they did a great job on that. So, but, but Epa Barnes, like I said, was a slave that came back and settled right here in Prince William County where he was a slave. His house was in the path of today's Route 234. When they widened 234, made it four lanes, um, his house was in the way. So they, they moved his house out of the way for a while. And then later on, they moved it down to the Montclair Library. And it still exists today. You can see it down at the Montclair Library grounds. But like I said, his land has not been researched. And it's very possible that his land that he farmed was the land that we're talking about here where the data centers are, are planned to go. Um, so my my high in the sky goal is to, if we could protect this land and we could bring his house back here and we could have a north entrance to Prince William Forest Park that's right here on this 162 acres because it is contiguous to the park grounds. The, um, the park management has been uh, looking for a north entrance to the park for a number of years. So we could really combine a number of different factors here and, and, and give this a sense of place, Independent Hill, and give this a sense of community and, and respect the history here. And maybe even have, along with the Barnes House and some other information, we could have a, a learning center, a teaching center, along with the park entrance here. There's a lot of things we could do on this, on this parcel. Um, and just a note for, for folks that aren't aware, uh, a search of of uh, public records indicates that the landowner here paid $3.5 million for this land last year. So that's about what we're looking at for the apparent value of the land according to what was paid for it last. It, it will be a heavy lift for either the county or the, uh, or the parks department, the federal park department to, to buy this land, I understand that. But I just think that we should before we commit this to having a data center here or a public facility office or something like that, um, I would hope that we could do this research and find out once and for all where Epa Barnes family land was and we could have an opportunity to tell this story. Now, something else we could do at the same time is that there was, there was a large African-American community in Prince William Forest Park on the park grounds that were basically relocated when the park was built. And th that, those, that was called Batestown, the, the, the community that existed there. So we could combine these two things and have, have this all at this 
uh, learning center and, and this and and this could be you know, this could be a real tool for economic growth in the county too because you know what, according to our economic development department one of the big things that that employers look for when they want to come to Prince, when to come to any location one of the things they look for is quality of life and amenities and open space and green space and trails and things like that so i mean instead of just putting a few data centers here this could pay dividends economically to bring employers to Prince William County. So, so if you look at all these things together, we, I, I think we have a real opportunity here uh, on, this, on this particular 162 acres to, to provide something really important for the county. Um, and, and Kim, that's all I really have. You're muted, Kim. Okie doke, not anymore. Thank you very much. That was really terrific and added a lot. <clears throat> and I just want to mention again that in the, when, when you speak of a purchase of the land, and the county certainly would need to be a participator. But again, there are local, regional, state, and federal partners that have been working together for this property. And um, really what we need is for the county to understand the value and to become a participator also. And then moving on, um, I would like to introduce Elizabeth Ward, who is um, an, a really a water expert. And if you haven't read, she's an author of the Green Risks blog. And if you haven't read that, I highly recommend it. And with that, I want to welcome you, Elizabeth. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And I'm going to try and share my screen here to see if I can, okay, what have I got going on here? Um, not here. Uh, hmm. Let me try to pull that up. Otherwise, I'll have to give it up as a fail. If it's open on your computer, you should be able to share it. Uh, it is open on my computer. And Did I you am... click the share screen? Yeah, I'm just not seeing the program. So, I... There you go. All right. Okay, that, that was... There it is. Um, as of late, our county board of supervisors have seen inclined to eliminate the Royal Crescent protections, which have truly served to protect our regional water and uh, groundwater resources and protect Prince William County taxpayers and water and electricity rate payers from the expense of building the infrastructure to bring water, sewer, and power out to the Royal Crescent. What you have here is, let's see if we can move this over a little is a um, chart showing the relative size of all data centers in the United States. And this is Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia is not only the largest data center market in the nation, it is the largest on earth. And what makes Virginia so special? It's that we're the biggest suckers at the table. Besides massive amounts of land, um, servers, backup generators that are powered by diesel for when the power goes down, which are one-time capital expenditures, data centers need massive amounts of electricity and water to operate every day. As you can see under here, the data servers are, are eating up at the moment 1,027 megawatts of electricity day in and day out. That's a little more than a third of all the nuclear power generated in Virginia, um, which is our base load. And as I said before, um, a 15 megawatt data center <coughs> consumes 360,000 gallons of water a day. There's a certain amount of water that is indeed recycled. That's more than enough water for a thousand households, not a thousand people, a thousand 
five people households. Newer studies have pegged, pegged the water consumption much higher, uh, but I think they might have been cons uh, counting some of the um, reused water uh, as consumed water. Uh, the numbers for 360,000 are from Amazon. Latin County is the home of the largest collection of data centers, in case, you know, that, that didn't hit you in the head. There are more than 100 there. And they keep all their data centers in their data alley with an area with available electricity and recycled water. Loudoun Water expanded and improved their broad run uh, water reclamation plant and laid 14 miles <coughs> of pipe what they call purple pipe, because it is purple actually, for the recycled water to go from the wastewater treatment plant to all the data centers and back again. Um, the capital costs to build this out were actually hidden inside the bonding for the broad run uh, improvement projects. However, Loudon Water disclosed to the American Water Works um, last year that their reuse water strategy for the data centers, their operating expenses um, were greater than um, what they were receiving in water rates. The rest of the tab is being carried by the rate payer. Isn't that charming? So they get, they pay less for the water. The rate payer makes up the difference. The rate payer paid for the capital expenditure and data centers are just wonderful to have. Allowing data centers to be located in Prince William County outside areas with currently available power and water supply obligates the utilities to bring these connections at the rate payer's expense. As Elena pointed out earlier, uh, the only problem with Amazon, with the, uh, burying the, the wires for Amazon is that Amazon didn't pay for it. We are. And we will pay for all these hookups. As, the, as data centers are spread nilly-willy throughout the county. Our Board of Supervisors has shown an amazing lack of foresight and planning and randomly approving projects without knowing where the water is coming from. As a matter of fact, regionally, we are running out of water. We are undercharging for something that is going to be a very valuable resource in the not too distant future. When water was incredibly abundant, all they ever charged for was the expense of pumping it, you know, treating it and pumping it. But we're running out. The ICPRB, which is the Interstate uh, Commission on the Potomac River Basin that manages all the resources of the Potomac, um, looked at the climate studies and told us that we are getting, we are going to have bigger storms longer droughts and be warmer and we are going to run out of water even with the planned addition of 13 and a half billion additional reservoir gallons of water there isn't going to be not enough to weather the droughts so are these data centers going to give us back our water when we need it I doubt it um prince william county uh Board of Supervisors recently directed staff to incorporate in the comprehensive plan the goal of being 100% um, of Prince William County being 100, getting its electricity 100% from renewable sources by 2035. How does this project or the further expansion of data centers match with that goal and the goal to move automobiles into electric vehicles? requiring additional power. Texas has proven to all of us and uh, what happens when you don't plan ahead for what you can predict might happen. Bigger storms, power outages. All those diesel uh, generators firing up, issues. The County Board of Supervisors needs to stop and study what the cost of these zoning and comprehensive plan changes are to our water resources and the expenses that the community will have to bear. 
to build out the infrastructure to support these plans before they approve changes. It is premature to slate this area or any for development without a better understanding of the potential environmental impacts. Water resources of the county are largely unstudied with regard to sustain sustainability and adequacy of groundwater, surface water resources, and the essential resources such as wetlands and the habitats they support and the environmental services they provide us all. You can't just say, oh yeah, this is fine. Once you destroy these water resources, we will not have them in the future. And let me release this. Uh, stop share. Okay, give you back your screen. There you go. And turn it to Elaine, I guess. Kim, you're still muted. So oh, thank you very much. And thank you, Elizabeth. That was so fascinating. We have one more speaker before we get to questions, comments, and conversation, who is Elena Schlossberg, who is um, with the Coalition to Protect Prince William and the Prince William Conservation Alliance. Welcome, Elena. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth is such a hard act to follow. I wish I had <laughs> gone before her. <laughs> um, so... First, I just want to, I know for people uh, who fought the, um, the uh, Amazon transmission line, this, this feels like Groundhog Day. Only it's like Bill Murray is not learning anything new. And that's what I feel about this board. No person who is serious about climate change or the environment would approve this small area plan specifically or any data centers in uh, the Rural Crescent. So I just wanna give a brief history about what we discovered about data centers in their energy consumption. Dominion Energy originally came to um, the town of Haymarket and said, you guys are using so much power, we need to put in this massive transmission line that's 110 feet tall and requires a, a 120 foot easement cleared forever. And what ensued in a nutshell, was that it wasn't the town of Haymarket, they had lied. It was actually an Amazon data center campus that nobody knew about uh, across the street uh, on 55, uh, right outside the Rural Crescent. And what we discovered was that the amount of power they needed was nothing anybody could ever have imagined. Um, and the impact was real to the community. It ended up involving thousands of residents um, I appreciate the nice words from Janine, but this was a collective effort. Uh, it's true with Karen Sheehan and uh, Bob Weir and so many I can't name. Um, and the community stood together because we understood what we were being asked to do was sacrifice our environment, our homes, our historic assets for one bulk loser who also happens to be making money in the billions hand over fist. And so we decided not only should we not have to pay for their infrastructure, but they should be made to pay for their own energy extension cord. So I wanna just put this number out for people. The, the Amazon data center in Haymarket is 450,000 square feet. The number I'm gonna give you is for a data center that's a million square feet, can consume as much power as a city of a million people in total the data center industry eats up more than 2% of the world's electricity and emits as roughly as much CO2 as the airline industry. Now, I, I share the story about the community um, wanting Amazon to pay because we believe the only way to incentivize uh, data centers to shrink their footprint is to make them pay for their own energy. And what we what we were able to do was convince the state corporate commission to agree with that. And so in their finding, in their legal brief, uh, they said, the record developed herein reveals that the company, Dominion, has already constructed at least two transmission line projects to extend service to new data center loads, similar to that requested by the customer, in this case, Amazon, in this application, which have not, de which have not developed as expected or at all. Thus, in reviewing these line extensions, their extension cord, their transmission line, 
the commission, the SEC judge, may wish to require the customer requiring such a project to put some of its own skin in the game. Otherwise, the general public, us, already burdened by the environmental and aesthetic impacts of otherwise unneeded transmission projects is also not burdened with 100% of the otherwise unnecessary costs. So what Elizabeth brought up was really interesting because we had a problem actually putting a number on the amount of water. The, the uh, transmission line part was easy. So I think it's important to take into consideration that this board not paying attention to the overlay district that was created specifically because of the chaos that ensued is not paying attention to the fact that we specifically included the landfill. Now, if you had a landfill to put the data centers on, why would you go to environmentally sensitive land across the street? It makes no sense. Um, I also wanna make sure people understand that um, I asked a question of uh, the uh, economic uh, development director. And what I asked her was, um, what is the parcel size that's too small? And what she said was data centers are looking for at least 30 to 40 acres of contiguous land, but there are other factors. Many data centers are seeking a hundred acres or more. Listen to what Janine Lawson just told you. That 40 acres, that's not enough. They're gonna want probably that hundred. Look at that map Kim showed you. Can you imagine a worse place to put a data center? It's industrial blight. They create environmental blight. The 40 acres that Amazon is in and Haymarket, there's not a speck of green left. They create carnage. And what we're looking at right now is a climate change crisis. People are literally freezing to death in their own homes. And if this board, this board cannot adopt a climate resolution and then, and then approve destruction like this. Um, I, I, you know, I, one of the, I was joking and I said, maybe what we could do is on the sides of these huge data centers, we can, we can do these beautiful murals, murals of what used to be there because what they are doing uh, is not sustainable. It's not in the best interest of the people who live here for our water, for our environment, for our pocketbooks. There is no way that you can combine conservation with industrial blight. That is impossible. You cannot believe that we're gonna have a program that's gonna protect open space next to these data centers. It's impossible. And so I think what we want the board to start thinking about is what is your legacy? Where is your integrity? I don't remember anybody on this board who ran for office saying that they were gonna put industrial blight in the rural area. It doesn't benefit the community. And that's who they should be looking out for. Thanks, Elena. Great job. If you and Elizabeth have a strong finish. And before we move on, I would just like to comment on one thing. We've been talking about the water issues associated with the data centers. There's also water issues associated with the impervious surfaces that would be in the rural crescent, all of which drains to the Occoquan Reservoir. Years and years ago, Fairfax County purchased 5,000 acres so that there would be a buffer to protect the, the public drinking water supply on the Fairfax side, and they downzoned a really large area to protect the drinking water. At the time, Prince William declined to participate and said that we would um, do our part by ensuring large lot development in the watershed, which would be the rural crescent. So if we lose a rural crescent to industrial uses and increased densities, that will put our end of the bargain seriously at risk. And it's just definitely something to consider. 